Hi everyone, I'm Michael Pittman and today we're going to be talking about pterosaur flight anatomy and performance. So pterosaurs were the first vertebrates to develop powered flight and they were around for about 160 million years. Although we don't know much about the earliest stages of pterosaur flight, not in the same way we do, for example, for the feathered dinosaurs, we do know a huge amount about pterosaur flight, preserved from animals with wingspans as wide as a bus to ones that were very small, perhaps about the span of my hand. But there are other aspects of pterosaur flight anatomy and performance that remain poorly understood, and today I'm going to be talking about one of those. So this talk revolves around one specimen, BSP 1937-18. So this is a historic specimen that myself and Thomas G.K. studied firsthand in Munich. And it's a specimen that has already been known to have preserved soft tissues. So soft tissues spanning between the base of the neck and over the shoulders, soft tissues between the, the fingers and the wing, soft tissue behind the knee. So we chose this specimen particularly because of the, the soft tissues we found above the shoulder. And we conducted laser stimulated fluorescence imaging because we wanted to interrogate the soft tissues because often when you have soft tissues, the preservation can vary. You can have exceptional preservation where you can have the finest of details and sometimes the preservation can be quite nebulous and not really have much morphological information. So we wanted to use LSF to really look at this evidence in more detail. And what the imaging allowed us to do is to more vividly image these previously known soft tissues. And the soft tissues between the neck and the shoulder were particularly vivid and they formed the basis for this talk. When we first saw those uh, soft tissues, even before going to Munich, we were kind of thinking, it's kind of, they have an interesting shape. It seems quite tapered. It's not like Arnold Schwarzenegger and really bulky. It seems to be tapered and quite aerodynamic. And myself, Thomas G.K., both thought this because of our various backgrounds. Tom actually worked for an uh, airplane company at one stage where he dealt with parts for aircraft. I've always had a fascination with, with planes. And the reason that experience proved to be valuable is because that area preserved in this pterosaur is actually the junction between the body and the wing. So having that area tapered is aerodynamically useful because it reduces the drag of the animal. So in airplanes, uh, they have them. And that's why I remember as a kid sitting next to the wing and you can see this little piece of metal that's stuck between the, the fuselage and the wing. Uh, Tom actually manufactured those for a company he used to work for. And uh, I don't know what it was called. Tom said it's called a wing root fairing. So not all planes have this. It's something that adds extra cost to an airplane, but its function is to reduce drag. It gives the plane a few extra knots. And so birds have this. They use feathers to taper that body to wing profile. In uh, bats, they use the fur to do that. So what are observations in this pterodactyloid pterosaur? Um, shows that actually on close inspection, this structure is dominated by skeletal muscle. So pterosaurs uh, do have uh, interesting integumentary structures. They have a variety of feather-like structures. Some people think they are true feathers, some people don't, but regardless, they have very interesting covering. This particular pterodactyloid probably had some integument, but the dominant feature of this wing root fairing is skeletal muscle. Feathers and the fur, they can be controlled to some extent. So feathers can, because of the, the muscle underneath, can be moved particularly in the wing. In mammals, the, the hair can move, you know, for example, if you're cold, but not in a particularly aerodynamically complex way. The structures in birds and bats appear to be quite passive. Now, in the pterosaur, because the structure is skeletal muscle, what we think is as well as helping to 
reduce drag by tapering this body to wing junction, it should be able to be actively controlled. So we think that the skeletal muscle can control the camber of the wing, the actual profile of the wing when it first hits the air, the really aerodynamically important part of the wing. Manipulating the muscle, maybe you have to actively change that. And also a phenomenon called flutter control. Wings uh, can flutter, they can, they can kind of shake a bit in the wind, and having skeletal muscle in this particular part of the pterosaur wing can help to control that uh, phenomenon. So what we're seeing really in a pterosaur is, is rather interesting because it's kind of got um, a two for one deal because as well as helping to uh, taper that body uh, wing junction, it seems to have some other uh, uses. Another aspect though, it's regarding the position of that skeletal muscle. It goes all the way onto the top of the humerus. It should actually contribute to uh, force generation for the actual flight stroke itself. By manipulating that skeletal muscle in the fairing should contribute to wing elevation and also bringing the wing anteriorly, bringing it forward. So that's something that we, we don't actually see uh, in, in, in bats and birds, uh, but pterosaurs uh, made use of it. So with this one little feature, which in an aeroplane, some planes may or may not have, uh, pterosaurs are actually doing multiple things. In the late Jurassic, uh, not the very start of pterosaur evolution, but nonetheless at that time, they were actually doing something aerodynamically rather sophisticated. From our point of view, you know, this is an interesting aspect that really hasn't been uh, commented on uh, on much and um, you know be interesting to actually extend this kind of imaging to other pterosaur specimens we have a lot of other data but uh, extend it to uh, across the entire group to see how this kind of phenomenon develops uh, but the bottom line is you know even with specimens where we know we have soft tissue and can see that we have soft tissue techniques like LSF can really help to uh, buttress our data and uh, to kind of uh, support some really interesting phenomena. Thanks for listening.